Hello, and welcome to this IIEA webinar. My name is David O'Sullivan. I'm the Director General of the Institute, and I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Congressman Brendan Boyle, whom I have known from my time in Washington, who's a member of the House of Representatives representing Pennsylvania's second congressional district. And he's been generous enough to take time out of his extremely busy schedule to talk to us today. He serves on the House Committee on Ways and Means. He's chairman of the Congressional European Union Caucus and is a member of the Friends of Ireland Caucus. And he's gonna give us some of his thoughts about the future of US, UK, and EU-UK relations in the aftermath of some of the tr tr tumultuous events we've seen in the last few weeks in the UK. Uh, and he may also share with us some thoughts about the possible impact of the US midterm elections on relations for the EU and the UK. Uh, the Congressman will speak uh, after his presentation, and then we will go to Q&A with our audience. You will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which I think we're all extremely familiar with at this point in our lives, and you should see on your screen. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you, and we will come to them once the Congressman has finished his presentation. And of course, you can also participate in the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. And I would remind you that today's presentation and the question and answer are both on the record. Let me now say a few words of introduction of Congressman Brendan Boyle before I give him the floor. Uh, Congressman Boyle was born and raised in the Olney neighborhood of Pennsylvania's second congressional district, which I've had the pleasure of visiting and meeting him there. A uh, first generation American, Congressman Boyle's father emigrated from Ireland. Uh, the first in his family to attend college, he attended the University of Notre Dame on a scholarship and later graduated from Harvard University's J.F. Kennedy School of Government. He was elected to the Pennsylvania House of Representatives in 2008. He became the first Democrat to represent Pennsylvania's 170th state legislative district. And in 2014, he was sent to Washington to represent his hometown in Congress. And I know how much that means to him as I had the occasion to, to meet with him there. He's now in his fourth term uh, and he proudly represents therefore the second congressional district. Once again, Congressman, thank you so much for taking time out. I know this is a particularly challenging time of year for members of the House of Representatives. So we're extremely grateful. The floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you, David. It's wonderful to uh, to be with you again. Um, I'm here from uh, my my home office uh, in my district, which covers about one half of the city of Philadelphia, uh, which you know well, uh, David. And I have to tell for for whoever is is listening and on, uh, David O'Sullivan did such a wonderful job representing the entirety of the European Union uh, to the United States when he was based in Washington. Uh, everyone knew him, well respected, well liked, um, and um, you know, I I I would go on uh, and say a few more nice things, but I know Stavros Lambertitis would get a little jealous, and he would accuse me of being biased in favor of the Irishman. So I will I will pause there and just say, David, you are very uh, very much missed in Washington. Thank you. Yeah. Very now um, I, I'm going to attempt to, uh, keep the remarks as brief as possible so we can maximize time, uh, for Q and A. I always find that uh, audiences do tend to be more interested in, in that. Um, but a few brief remarks. Um, so obviously the, uh, the centrality of the U S European relationship, which now is represented by U S EU and UK relationship, uh, is uh, I think without question and without argument. And if there was any discussion to be had about that, uh, the events of this year from late February on obviously show just again, the transatlantic relationship is the backbone of world security and the promotion of our shared values. Um, I have been very active in this space since the beginning of my congressional career now eight years ago. But really, I, I think we um, what has brought attention um, to these issues, at least here in the U.S. And, and elsewhere, is ever since the Brexit vote of June 2016. It's hard to believe it has now almost been six and a half years that many of us have been attempting to navigate the sometimes choppy waters that were brought about by that election result. Now, to be clear, my position, and it's shared by many of my colleagues on Capitol Hill, 
and both parties, certainly in the administration, as well as the previous administration, it is the right of the UK voters, um, as it is the right of any uh, electorate in any EU nation, to decide whether they want to remain a part of the European Union or not. So I respect that. In my view, the European Union is the greatest ongoing uh, peace process in the history of the continent and is a remarkable achievement that I'm proud to support. But again, it is uh, up to the uh, constituents and the citizens of each and every one of those countries as to whether they join or, or remain. So I respect the decision of the UK voters um, to make the decision that, that they did. Our interest in the United States, though, has been to ensure that essentially the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement, which, by the way, I still find it enormously frustrating that we can't even find a shared common term for a, uh, a peace agreement that's perhaps a sign of um, uh, you know, other more difficult uh, challenges, but be that as it may, whichever term you prefer, this was a major, major achievement. Uh, certainly of U.S. foreign policy, but not only U.S. foreign policy, London, Dublin, and most of all, the parties and people of Northern Ireland themselves. So our interest in the United States has always been to ensure that the uh, Good Friday Agreement was upheld, preserved, not just the letter of the law, but also the spirit of the law. And that certainly extended to the open, open and seamless border that exists on the island of Ireland today. Indeed, if you were a completely politically unaware, unaware person, and you're a tourist, and you're traveling um, from Donegal to Derry, or from Dublin up to Belfast, you would frankly be unaware that you did just travel a uh, or pass through a border from one state to another. So that is has been our interest. That's not the only way, by the way, in which the Good Friday Agreement could potentially be violated. There are other subtle ways but that obviously uh, is, is chief among them. So I have been active uh, as well as a number of my colleagues, especially Speaker Pelosi. Um, we have traveled um, to Ireland, to Dublin, Belfast, to London. We have met with now, I, I can't help, can't, can't count how many uh, British governments we have, uh, we have uh, met with, um, including a 10 Downing Street. Uh, I was there and walked, uh, walked a portion of the border with Speaker Pelosi and a number of my colleagues to demonstrate how committed uh, we are to this to this issue. Um, you know, when Bill Clinton wrote his uh, autobiography some years ago now, he talked about this being the most important foreign policy achievement of his presidency and just how much time he devoted to it. And it has been also the work of successive presidential administrations. George W. Bush probably does not get as much credit as he deserves for the amount of time he spent on this issue as well, appointing David Haas as special envoy, a very well-respected uh, diplomat. So uh, that has been the American perspective, and, and that has been the work that we've done, as I said now, over the last six and a half years. Um, it is in the best interest of the EU, the US, and especially the UK, that we finally uh, put a bow on this issue and enable us to move on to so many other issues that we could be and need to be discussing. Now, let me go specifically to the protocol. Um, I was quite, and I was on a, uh, I can't remember if it was um, BBC or, or Channel 4, but when the protocol finally was negotiated and agreed to some a couple of years ago, when famously Boris Johnson and then Taoiseach Leo Varadkar did a, a walk together. And if you remember the image from that, um, I was enormously happy. I said that this would open the door and said in that interview, this would certainly uh, eliminate any remaining uh, roadblocks to the discussion of a US-UK free trade agreement, which certainly presents uh, possible opportunities, although isn't without its own challenges, um, as any trade agreement uh, certainly is. Um, and that was was our position. So it was quite disturbing and shocking that then in the months that followed, we started to hear uh, quite loudly backsliding from our friends in Westminster, that perhaps they weren't as committed to the protocol that they led the uh, negotiation of, and of course, agreed to. And so we have been stuck in this position uh, ever since that point. 
I am hopeful, though, that um, whatever may happen this week or in the next several weeks uh, in British politics, that finally, whether it's this government or another government that emerges, the British government would recognize it is in their best interests to um, move on from this, to work with the EU, which has been enormously responsible. I, not perfect, but Mr. Sefcovich, um, the amount of blood, sweat, and tears he has poured into uh, this agreement. I, I think he's probably the greatest expert on Northern Ireland at this point in, in our lifetime. Um, uh, and I, I told him no good deed goes unpunished as he is, is uh, finding out. But I want to stress it is in all of our interests, but especially the UK's interest, that we um, not unilaterally, but all of us resolve this issue and move forward for two reasons. First, the substance of Northern Ireland itself um, with a, uh, a Stormont government that is still not up and running with always you know, the potential for violence because of ten tensions not very far beneath the surface. While I don't think we will ever go back to the bad old days of the 70s and 80s, there is, as we've seen from time to time, still the potential for violence and the potential for others to exploit that and to to goad it on. So it's best that we, um, you know, really uh, close the bottle, uh, the lid on on that genie. But then, even beyond the substance of Northern Ireland uh, itself and the issue, uh, continuing to endlessly discuss and debate this issue is frankly a luxury we can't afford. Uh, we have now a war in Europe one nation state invading another for the first time since World War II. That war uh, between Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, frankly, has the potential, as we all know, to get even worse and to get more dangerous. That is something that we should be focusing on. We also have a worldwide inflation crisis. Uh, we have our midterm elections uh, exactly three weeks from today. The most dominant issue in this campaign has been the inflation crisis here in, in the US. And uh, I know that frankly, our inflation rate as high as it is, it's at a 40 year high, that pales into com in comparison to, to some parts of the world and some parts of Europe. We should be instead discussing and talking about ways that we can work together collaboratively to solve this challenge. And of course, there are, there are so many others. So uh, I will pause it there. I, I, looking at the, the clock, it looks like I kept within the parameters there's obviously much more to discuss, but i um, happy to, to be with you and, and have the opportunity to talk about these important issues. Thank you.